Hearty welcome to all of you. Thank you for uh, joining uh, the fourth uh, summer school on theoretical function computer science. The topic for this time is uh, data privacy. So we got about 260 uh, confirmed uh, participants uh, across the India. So that, that, that's actually very nice. And then uh, I see that uh, 70, at least 70 have joined and I'm sure more will be joining soon. So we have... Uh, with us now, Professor Deva Prata Das. Professor Das is the director of uh, AAAT Bangalore. So, and uh, we really thank him for you know, sparing uh, his valuable time in, uh, in his busy schedule to address you. So, Professor Das, uh, if you can address the gathering, I think. Thank you, uh, Dr. Srinivas Vivek, for introduction. And also, I want to thank, first of all, uh, Dr. Srinivas Vivek, Dr. Pradesh Ashok. Dr. Minakhi Disoza, and also the team of Professor Srinath and also Madhav, all those uh, people who have started the summer school, and also these two people who have supported also the summer school by sponsoring. First of all, this, what I wanted to say is this the summer school of the AAIT Bangalore, particularly in the computer science area, has been popular year after year. It shows from the huge number of registrations coming across the country from the top institutes to many other, other institutes showing students showing interest. Not only the students, faculty members, and some of the engineers from the companies are also attending this summer school. It shows the quality of the summer school previous years, and people are very much enthusiastic to attend this year's summer school because the topic is really, really relevant with respect to the present areas of research and innovation, that is data privacy. AAIT Bangalore has been doing a lot of research on technically data privacy and also in the policy areas of the data privacy uh, with respect to the countries and the citizen as concerned. So I'm sure all the participants for the summer school will be highly benefited because of very eminent speakers who have been invited to present their areas of interest and research during the summer school. I uh, also advise the participants to uh, attend all the talks and also participate in the interactions and question our sections. Thank you again to my colleagues, Professor Srinivas Bivek, Professor Pradisa, and Professor Minaki for hosting such a summer school every year and making the participants understand the subjects in more in detail and in depth. Wishing the summer school a grand success over the week and see you all again next year, whoever interested or your, your friends and juniors who will be participating in this kind of summer schools. Thank you again and over to Professor Srinivas Vivek. Thank you, Professor Das, for the encouraging words. and. Uh... Yeah, thanks again for sparing the time. Uh, so next, my request, uh, Professor Chandrasekhar, uh, uh, who is the Dean of Academics at AAAT Bangalore to address the gathering, please. A very, very good morning to all of you. And um, I'm delighted to be speaking to all of you at the inauguration of the uh, fourth summer school of the computer science, uh, theoretical computer science. I would like to compliment the organizers, Professor Srinivas Vivek, Professor Srinath, Professor Pradesha, and Professor Meenakshi for uh, continuing to uh, run this particular popular uh, summer school uh, year after year. And uh, the theme, especially for this year, is, uh, is very, very apt and uh, relevant, which is uh, essentially on data privacy. And uh, I was also uh, very happy to see that, uh, uh, you know, all the three, the data privacy is being presented from uh, uh, you know, three very important dimensions, which is essentially the theoretical aspects of uh, ensuring data privacy, but uh, the, the applications uh, elements as well, because, uh, because at the end of the day, uh, the uh, data privacy became a big concern uh, because of the way the applications have started using the users uh, holding and using both uh, the users' private data. Right? So, which means that the application perspective is also 
quite important and relevant and uh, and many of these things are governed by uh, by policies so that that very very important aspect of uh, of the policy is also being covered as part of the summer school so i'm uh, i'm delighted to be uh, you know to to welcome all of you for this very uh, very very interesting uh, summer school i hope and i would also like to take this opportunity to thank the uh, sponsors of this particular uh, summer school this year uh, i know iudx from iisc under the uh, professor srinath srinivasas uh, leadership uh, and then the center for internet of ethical things which is a which is a center established by the government of karnataka under professor madhav rao so i would like to thank both the professors and the respective centers for sponsoring this year's uh, summer school so i think um, uh, we uh, i think all there are uh, uh, nearly 100 participants already online so i think without much, uh, much further delay i would like to hand it over back to the participants for uh, wishing the event a wonderful success and have a wonderful time thank you yeah. thank you professor chandrashekar for spending time and addressing the gathering thank you very much so we also have with us uh, Uh, our co-organizers, uh, Professor Meenakshi Dizos and uh, Dr. Professor Pradeesh Ashok, uh, would you like to say hello to the gathering, please? Yeah, nothing much from my side. Uh, just a hearty welcome to all the participants, and uh, we look forward to a great summer uh, school on data privacy. Thanks. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Welcome all uh, from my side also, and uh, yeah, wish. Uh, Ourselves and the summer school all the best, and I welcome the participants once again, and uh, yeah, wish you a very uh, successful summer school. Great. So then, uh, yeah. So that was a small, very small, informal inauguration. So I think we can get started with the session. So just to tell you more about the school and some logistics. So you know that the school is on uh, data privacy, and we plan to address uh, theoretical applied. and policy aspects of uh, uh, of uh, uh, you know data data privacy okay. um, so we will have two lectures every day so from 10 to 230 uh, 10 to 1130 am and then 2 to 330 pm right uh, and we have like very uh, distinguished uh, speakers uh, so then uh, and uh, i think one more important thing is uh, we also plan to give out uh, certificates uh, of attendance in case you uh, make a request right so then only a uh, uh, criterion uh, would be that you know you need to attend at least 9 out of the 10 sessions okay so so we'll be able to track your session uh, you know your uh, login times using and uh, the zoom uh, log uh, so this is just to you know encourage uh, you know participation i know that online uh, events can be you know can get uh, quite boring sometimes uh, you know because that in person uh, aura is not there so this is a small attempt from our end to uh, you know uh, encourage participation okay uh, and then of course uh, uh, you can uh, uh, please try to use the the zulip uh, chat uh, so to record your questions so that, that that's good because then you can you know uh, you know we will be you will be able to track uh, uh, the discussion uh, uh, like um, in the future also so if you of course you can also you are welcome to post uh, your questions in the zoom chat window but if the session gets uh, uh, you know uh, after the session gets end then we don't have uh, we will not have access to those chat messages so that's why we encourage you to use the zulip chat and i am sure one of our volunteers is will be trying to monitor the the questions and then also they'll they can communicate it to the the panelists okay so if you have any questions the other uh, uh, about the logistics then please uh, let me know uh now we have some problem you know for others to other panelists to share the screen we i'm sure we will uh, sort it out uh and then uh, you know in the meanwhile let me know if you have any questions uh we'll be starting today summer school uh, summer school with the session uh, uh introduction to cryptography taken by professor srinivas vivek uh, about uh, professor srinivas uh, srinivas vivek 
Dr. Srinivas Vivek obtained his PhD from the University of Luxembourg, Luxembourg in 2015. He was affiliated to the Laboratory of Algorithmics, Cryptology and Security in the Computer Science and Communications Research Unit. His doctoral thesis was in cryptography and was supervised by Professor Jean Sebastian Coron and Professor David Galindo. He was a postdoctoral research associate in the cryptography group of the Department of Computer Science at the University of Bristol between June 2015 and December 2017. He did his MSc Engineering at the Indian Institute of Science, Bangalore, India, and was affiliated to the Department of Computer Science and Automation. His thesis was supervised by Professor Vini Madhavan. Prior to this, he obtained B.Tech in Information Technology from National Institute of Technology, Karnataka, Suratpur, India in 2008. Dr. Vivek joined IIIT Bangalore as assistant professor in January 2018. He currently holds the Infosys Foundation Career Development Chair Professorship and is also a DST Inspire Faculty Fellow. Oh, thank you, Anju, for the, the, the kind introduction. And I also would like to make special welcome to the volunteers who have put in a lot of effort, you know, uh, in organizing this school. So, so I'll be thanking them more formally towards the end of this school. Uh, but for now, uh, uh, hearty welcome to them. Okay. So I'll just uh, I'll get started. Uh, I share my screen. Uh, in this. Uh, this un, un, uh, lecture tomorrow morning, I'll be introducing you uh, to cryptography. Okay, so we'll see what is cryptography. Okay? But uh, before that, what I would like to motivate is uh, I want to motivate an you know an application where you know you can see uh, clearly the role of cryptography. So and of course, app to our. Uh, uh, the theme of the school, I'll be looking at a, a security application in the IoT setting. So first I want to introduce that and so that you, you appreciate the, the role of cryptography there. And then we will look in, into the more details of uh, cryptography. Okay. Uh, of course, so this being uh, like just uh, three, two, two sessions of 1.1 age, you only able to you know get to know some keywords okay? because you know teaching crypto can span several semesters, right? Uh, so so the objective would be to introduce you to very fundamental concepts, okay, and get to know some key terms, and this should motivate you to you know further. Uh, uh, take up the study of uh, cryptography through the courses uh, uh, in your institute or maybe some online uh, uh, courses and so on. Okay. Uh, as you know, the internet thinks it describes uh, an ecosystem of uh, uh, some objects, physical objects, it could be computing units, okay, with, uh, and they can be emb embedded units with sensors, some, some computing ability, software, and other uh, communication technologies that connect and exchange you know, data uh, with other devices and other systems over the internet or other communication networks. Okay, so this is uh, so popular that you know this need not uh, be given uh, any uh, uh, detailed introduction, right? And of course, we also know that IoT has a lot of applications, right? Uh, you can. Uh, roughly uh, categorize them as uh, consumer applications or commercial industrial applications uh, iiot iiot stands for industrial iot right and then uh, uh, applications in other infrastructure uh, spaces okay for instance it could be as far as the consumer applications uh, is concerned it could be in you know iot is used in connected vehicles right now uh, vehicles are like pretty smart right so you so we have infrastructure communication right and then uh, in the under uh, not uh, like very far in the future we might even have uh, so uh, so then uh, not far in the future we also will have uh, connected uh, you know so vehicles talking to each other right? maybe in a, a driverless car and so on right so this is one application where iot has a lot of applications okay home automation right so alexa is uh, one of the like uh, very nice examples of smart bulbs and then we also have the wearable technology right all the smart race and uh, so on and then uh, and on, on also in the medical uh, setting right so iot play a lot of role for example i think smart pumps or something like that right uh, where it can monitor uh, our health parameters and then and also automatically inject some medicines into the body 
right so and uh, so these are some like very important and uh, applications uh, in the iot setting and as far as uh, industrial iot is concerned so in the manufacturing sector nowadays they use a lot of uh, you know uh, uh, the scope to use a lot of uh, iot technology right um, in manufacturing where you know you use sensors to measure various industrial parameters like pressure uh, heat uh, temperature so on right and in the in the in the agricultural setting also where you, you you can even possibly use it to sense the nature of the soil or the nature of the the climate and then uh, uh, take suitable action right and then yeah, as far as the infrastructure spaces are concerned then you know uh, like smart cities are a very classical examples where uh, you have a lot of uh, connected devices across the city and then say and you might use it to make the transportation more intelligent right and more efficient so and then manage the environment and, uh, and uh, observe and manage uh, the the climate for instance so on right and then uh, so these are all are all smart meters for instance right where uh, that can be deployed to make efficient uh, use of uh, the electricity okay? so these are some application there are many more okay and then it's expected that by 2025, there will be 25 billion IoT devices. So I, the population of the world is about seven or eight billion, right? So now it's going to be three. So uh, three times. So each each uh, person will have will account for approximately three IoT devices by 2025. That's amazing, and then it's bound to grow. And all these things sound good, but then uh, we should also you know equally worry about the, the security and privacy implications of these things so there are a lot of you know recorded uh, incidents uh, security in incidents involving the iot uh, technology so for instance in october 2016 so there was a multiple distributed denial ser service ddos you know as it is pop popularly abbreviated so ddos attacks on systems operated by a domain name system provider you know, you use domain name systems uh, that are used by the web browsers, right? So, in order to map the the URL to the the host, uh, the IPs, right? So, so DDoS attack was uh, performed on a DIN uh, DNS uh, service provider, and this caused inaccessibility of several websites, including GitHub, Twitter, and uh, others. Right, and this attack was executed through a botnet consisting of large number of IoT devices. Okay, and uh, interestingly, they included some cameras. Okay, some even baby monitors. Okay, so you use this ability, the the connectedness. Okay, and the cap uh, computing capability of this IoT, even tiny embedded IoT devices, to you know mount large scale attack. So basically, in a DDoS attack, you just flood the service provider with so many requests that it will not be able to you know uh, offer uh, it will be slowly processing and it will not be able to distinguish between you know what is a, a fake request or a genuine request right so uh, this is how you choke uh, choke a service right and then uh, and there are also some other interesting incidents in 2019 uh, hackers used some lasers to speak to amazon echo or google home right uh, so then, uh, yeah, and also in say in 2020, hackers they just used an ordinary light bulb to spy on conversations. Okay, so interestingly, they used you know the looking at the the, the vibrations, <laughs> you know, what uh, the conversations uh, they you know the 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 people in a room make. And looking at the impact, they could look at those fine observations, and then they could somehow deduce. So all these things have been reported in the newspaper, and there are several, several you know security incidents like this, and they really raise uh, the concern about the security of the IoT setting. And also, according to a report, uh, there were 639 billion data uh, breaches of just iot devices in 2020 alone okay and uh, and in in just the first half of 2021 there were 1.5 billion breaches and then you know if we don't act 
uh, in time, then we can just expect this data to just exponentially grow. I mean, the number of uh, IoT security you know, incidents. So, so it's so important that we look at how we, you know, typically security is thought as an afterthought, okay? Thought of as an, uh, uh, as an afterthought. I mean, okay, you create a, a system, right? And then you add security to that. But so looks like, uh, you know, we no longer can afford that. And then security uh, has to be considered at the design phase itself. Right. Um, and also, just to give you another example, so, so security of the IT cloud, I want to take another example. So these IoT applications, they are moving towards this cloud, IoT cloud ecosystem. Okay. So why, why they want to do that? It's because uh, the cloud services are now available at affordable rates, right? And then, uh, and it will also ensure data and availability uh, anytime, okay, and anywhere access. That, that's very, very uh, a powerful resource. And it also, you know, you can use the cloud services to perform data analytics and then improve the services, right? Okay. So just to give you another example of this IoT cloud, uh, a particular instance rather of the IoT cloud setting is the Amazon's Alexa service. So Alexa senses voice from users data, okay? And it sends the captured data to the cloud. So cloud responds to Alexa after processing the data, right? That's where the intelligence comes from. And then Alexa can control, of course, Alexa also has some in, inbuilt intelligence like voice recognition, so on. But then if the, the, uh, no, the, the internet uh, is made use of to, you know, uh, to actually answer your the human questions, right? And also Alexa can control other IoT devices, right? In, uh, for instance, it can act as a smart home hub. hub. And also, so, so let me illustrate, you know, in order to motivate, uh, you know, the security challenges. So, so some points I'm going to illustrate. So, so what are the challenges? Is it for, you know, uh, dealing with the security of this uh, IoT and IoT cloud settings? So a typical IoT ecosystem, it has a large scale sense, right? So for instance, millions of users, they deploy smart voice assistance in their homes. Okay, so the, the 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 magnitude itself is a big challenge, right? And then and it's not just that; it has also a lot of diversity, right? Because so you want to make the ecosystem open means you want to allow different devices, okay, like different varieties of smartphones to connect, right? So and your TVs, you now they are from different manufacturers. So they you want them to join the the cloud system, right? You want to make it open. Right, but this also brings in uh, uh, brings in a lot of vulnerability. So, as you might have popularly heard, so the uh, uh, the strength of a chain is as strong as the weakest link. So, so even the same thing is true for security also. Right. So, even if one of the devices or one of the nodes is not secure, then the hacker can gain entry into that. Uh, device and then through that it uh, you know he or she can enter the the entire ecosystem okay so you need to make sure that all those different devices they are all secure right and this is a really a great uh, challenge and then uh, cloud ecosystem also features uh, more uh, uh, diversity like for example, a uh, uh, cloud application which is offered by a commercial company and they also uses, or and uh, it has to be used by many users, right? And then they also buy a different device of the same type, so on, right? Again, the the diversity is uh, it's a challenge, correct? And then the last but not the least point uh, is the ecosystem also in one, uh, the ecosystem, the cloud IoT cloud ecosystem also involves more human participation, okay? Because it not only senses data from human life, but it also offers a chance for the user to control the IoT devices, right? So, so we also need to look at the human aspects of the security also. So these are some, you know, briefly some challenges regarding the IoT cloud setting, you know, and uh, as you see in, can see in the footnote, that's a very nice uh, survey uh, regarding, uh, you know, uh, the cl uh, cloud security, uh, particularly looking at the, the case of uh, 
know uh, consumer uh, you know uh, emerging consumer oriented applications you know for the iot clouds okay and then so just look at the, what are the entities involved uh, for instance uh, uh, there's a user so because you need to first understand what are the entities involved in order to you know uh, design a secure uh, iot cloud ecosystem right so we have the users and we have the voice assistant okay the box what you typically see the alexa box uh, which access iot gateway to the internet and we have the cloud services and we have also third party applications okay and then so some again the some so what what are what could be the points of vulnerabilities you know the third party apps they could be malicious right so so you have one malicious entity and then that entity will gain access to the entire system uh, potentially okay so then you need to put in safeguards so that you ensure you, know, you handle these cases and then try to isolate that app or the device right and then uh, so there could be say what are what are some interesting class of attacks called voice squatting attack so so you you know when you try to pass on a command uh, for instance to alexa right uh, so then and and of course and uh, you know each person speaks differently right so so it will not be very accurate and there are many chances uh, many instances uh, where it can be possible it can be intentionally misinterpreted to do some malicious activity okay uh, say for instance say alexa mm, uh, uh, open uh, uh, say google.com okay and then say uh, so you expect alexa to open google.com okay oh no i mean or at least maybe youtube okay or play a song something like that so what if you can just you know uh, mis carefully misinterpret that word. So, say suppose you name. Uh, I know this is a silly example, but this is certainly a you know a possibility. So, you say that okay, you create an app called uh, Alexa, or maybe Google dot com, please, or so say say you say Alexa, open Google or YouTube, uh, please. So, what if I intentionally create an app called YouTube, please? Okay, so so then uh, then you know you can try to you know misinterpret all these things. So this uh, belongs to a category of attacks called voice quoting attacks. So so I'm just so presenting the example so that you know that you know what are some security challenges involved. And of course you know man in the attacks man in the middle attacks are very popular attacks. That uh, so you want to use a if you want to use a private key then uh, this is a very uh, serious scenario. Okay. So we just talked about you know the IoT cloud thing. What are the applications or what are security challenges, entities involved, so on, right? So then, where is the the the, the, the you know the main topic of uh, today's lecture is you know uh, okay the crypto. We need to understand cryptography. So we need to see okay what is the role of cryptography. So crypto is used, of course, a lot of users in the IoT setting. I'm just you know uh, trying to. Re, uh, Put some very important ones. So crypto is used for the the TL is used in the TLS protocol. So that protocol, you know, a, for instance, in HTTPS, right? So it, uh, these things are used to provide confidentiality and authentication of the data. So that protocol will establish a secure session between two communicating parties. So TLS protocol is at the core of this, and then crypto forms the core of the TLS protocol. So without crypto, uh, it would not have been uh, uh, possible, right? Uh, and then it's not just that, okay? We're not just for uh, you know securing the basic communication. So it's also some advanced crypto primitives that I'll briefly talk about later in my lecture. So it it also related to cloud privacy. So cloud has data in the clear, right? So as I mentioned in the previous slide. Uh, in the Alexa, where it processes, you know, it understands your command and processes it onto the cloud. That response, right? Cloud needs to know that. So, the, so now you are trying to, you know, outsource the trust to the cloud. Okay? So many times, uh, so they would, the cloud would try to do, uh, uh, you know, things honestly. I means it will try to ensure your data privacy because its reputation otherwise would be at stake, right? And also there could be you might ensure legal safeguards. 
for the legal system you know it, it takes its own time to resolve any dispute right so so uh, cryptographers began thinking okay can we look at more uh, technology oriented approach to ensure data privacy and that's when you they came up with the uh, you know, like very, very powerful primitives called secure multi-party computation and home of encryption, okay, that that will uh, uh, try to ensure data, uh, the privacy of your data from the cloud, yet you will be able to do all your analytics and get other services, okay. And of course, another really <laughs> uh, popular buzzword is blockchains, right, and then uh, so who knows, uh, they, they can also find, uh, and already we have been seeing a lot of uses of blockchain technology in the IoT setting also, and probably in, we might expect, uh, you know, more future uses, right? So at least now we know that we have heard the word crypto, okay? So again, before, so we now let's start looking uh, into these details more carefully. Uh, so before that, let me check if, uh, uh, there are some questions. Uh, yes, we are recording uh, uh, these things, and then uh, we hope to, uh, you know, um, you know, edit it, and then our uh, the media team will edit this, and then uh, we we plan to post it on um, our the Triple ITB's YouTube channel. But this could take uh, some time. Uh, so that's regarding recording. Any other question? Okay, uh, I don't see anything else. Okay, if there aren't any questions, then uh, if uh, uh, Sham uh, or Anju, uh, is someone monitoring the Zulip uh, chat? Uh, yes, we are monitoring the Zulip okay, chat. There are no questions. Any questions? There are no questions, sir. There are no questions there. Okay, good. So then I'll just get going. So, uh, so okay. So, so we know that security is important. When crypto is important, okay. Let let's try to understand what what these things are. So, information security you can just say loosely define it as a set of techniques to prevent unauthorized acts or use of information, right? Uh, and of course, the need for information security in the digital age. I I need not you know emphasize more, right? We also have seen a concrete example of IoT. And then, so what are the goals of information security? So it's basically to ensure confidentiality, okay, where you don't want unintended, unintended uh, receivers of your message to read the read your the message, okay. Uh, only the the intended recipient should be able to read your message. Okay, authentication. So the recipients of the message should be sure where your data has originated. Okay, and then they also want to be sure or they want some sufficient guarantees that the data has not been modified in transit, right? Even if it has been modified, then they should be able to detect that modification. Okay, so this, this is the role of authentication and data integrity. Okay. So another uh, unnecessary goal uh, or uh, objective of information security is what is called non-repudiation. So that means that you you want to prevent a uh, denial of previous commitments. Uh, so for instance, you, you order something, your pizza, right? Uh, then uh, say through whatever, Amazon or any other uh, food uh, service providers, okay? Uh, then you say that you'll pay them and then you don't want to, you know, later you deny that you ordered, right? So there should be a way to, you know, prove that, that, you know, if you requested a service that you did request a service. Right, uh, so these uh, techniques, you know, the prevention of denial of previous commitments, this is what is called non-repudiation, right? Uh, and so, what does crypto do? Is it crypto provides the mathematical foundations and techniques to realize the above goals of information security? Okay? So, this word mathematical is important, right? Because there are other techniques to achieve information security. Say, for instance, uh, a very popular example would be a uh, a postal letter, right? So you, it also sort of achieves, you know, data integrity, authentication, confidentiality, and possibly even non-repetition, right? But then you don't use crypto for that because it's not that, you know, people cannot tear the letter. It's just that, uh, you know, uh, the legal, 
there are legal safeguards around uh, you know uh, opening up uh, someone else's letter right so this info uh, ensures information security so another example where uh, crypto is not used but the information security is uh, provided is say, for instance the currency notes right so there you don't use crypto but you use special hardware uh, you know, special inks, special, uh, so not the hardware, I mean, the special paper, special inks. So to make sure that, you know, you, you will be able to distinguish between the, the genuine notes and the counterfeit notes, right? So it also provides information security, right? Uh, uh, in the sense that, uh, you know, that, okay, this is uh, the, the currency note issued by RBI, right? So, so information security is provided there, but it doesn't use crypto. But uh, of course, crypto is certainly needed, you know, in the digital setting, right? Because uh, all these things may not, uh, will not scale when there are billions of devices they are talking over the internet, right? So crypto is a part of information security. It's not equal to information security, but it's a very important core of information security. Right? Uh, and then, so crypto has a very nice history, starting from the Roman times. So Caesar cipher is very well known, right? And then uh, crypto also had a decisive outcome in the world wars. Okay, have you heard of uh, the German cipher Enigma? Can someone say yes? So, so, so let's understand what what are the core problems of traditional cryptography, at least in the in in its formative years. I would say the seventies and the eighties. Okay, crypto was all I told you, right? It was all no well before, but then it it really grew, uh, you know, during the seventies and the eighties, right? So historically, so this was the first core problem, you know, uh, for modern cryptography. So key established, say two entities they want to talk, say Raman and Sita, right? So they want to, they are talking over the internet. Okay, so this is modern Ramana. You can, you can pretend like that. Uh, and they have not met up, but they want to secure, exchange some secure messages. So they can only use, you know, the historical uh, symmetric key ciphers. Okay, I, I, you may not have heard of term. I will introduce you for those who do not know, but for those who know, they want to use that. But now the problem is how, how can they establish a secure private key for communication or, or a public channel which the adversary will have access to, right? So they are talking, right? And they want to come up with a secure key, okay? They want to later use a cipher uh, uh, that uses uh, this private, common private key for, you know, uh, encrypting their data. Okay, I'll also introduce later what this encryption means. Uh, but again, those who who know that for them. And then, uh, as I said, there's a public channel and then the Ramana, he's, uh, let's say, he's the adversary here and he's he's trying to read all those uh, messages, chats. Then you cannot just send over a key just like that, right? And uh, even the adversary will will uh, read off the key, right? Because people, uh, the adversary will be able to tap the public channel, right? Uh, so now, how, how do you do that? So this was the first problem cryptographers they were read. Okay, in the in the late seventies and the early eighties, or late seventies, rather I would say that. And then another problem is for the core secure communication. They want to exchange messages, and uh, in the presence of adversary, okay, or a public channel, and then you want to ensure confidentiality and integrity of the messages. Right. So these were the core problems. So so these things have been solved very very efficiently, and then, uh, but. Today's crypto can do much more than solving these things, really much, much more than these things. Mm -hmm. so, so one of these applications uh, is, I mentioned this word, right? Secure multi-party com com uh, computation. When I talked about uh, uh, the IoT cloud setting, right? The role of cryptography there. So, so it's basically, it provides a set of tools or techniques, cryptographic techniques where it allows you to compute a function of private inputs without revealing the inputs. For instance, say there are employees in, in an organization and then they want to calculate the average salary. So of course, each uh, employee must input their data. So one way, trivial way of doing it is, okay, so send it to a person, right? 
the head of the organization of course he would know that but just pretend that he may not know that and he is seeking their inputs so send it to one trusted party okay that trusted party will compute the sum and then the average right that's easy way to do but the problem is trust it's not whom do you trust how do you emulate this trust over the internet you don't want to trust anyone right so this uh, multi party computation will give you sort of protocols where the participant the employees them just they talk to themselves without really having any trusted party third party right and they can will compute the sum and then the average of uh, their inputs and they would not know anything other than their input say this uh, lady say suppose she will input x2 okay her salary x2 now she would not know anything more than x2 and of course the average right so the final output and their inputs they only know that they it's nothing is revealed beyond that so this is you know very fantastic application right and now you can see that uh, how these things will be useful in the in the the iot cloud setting comes so you give your commands that's your input okay the uh, cloud might you might be you know inquiring some resources or the internet or something uh, or possibly uh, you uh, you would outsource your email for instance right so that would be you know somehow uh, oh, no 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 okay so cloud would also give some input who knows right uh, okay so now you want to inquire something right that that's why you give the command to alexa so 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 you would still give your command and you would know your output but cloud would not know anything okay yeah this would be a like might seem a crude example but certainly you know uh, the mpc technology can be used in the setting okay oh uh, so rather how i would say that is uh, okay so you would know your input and you would get your output but you would not know the clouds the entire database okay yeah again this may not sound as convincing as the 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 sum of average of the salaries but some there is a way you can you know employ this technology to you know secure your cloud the your uh, whatever the data you output give it to the cloud okay bit more complicated so hopefully professor ashish choudhary when uh, during his lectures on wednesday and thursday he will talk in more details okay as i said that you know these protocols they emulate a centralized uh, entity without really having one okay so this is really achieving privacy in the decentralized uh, scenario okay and of course it has a lot of applications privacy preserving data mining e auction pattern matching whatever 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 e auctions okay so many applications so maybe uh so next cryptographic primitive would give you more intuitive solution to the problem i said you know you outsource data to the cloud and then no the cloud would not learn that okay so that primitive is called homomorphic encryption okay so it provides a way to compute on encrypted data okay so encryption is you you convert a text to you know something which is not intelligible okay which is gibberish okay and only if you know some secret information you will be able to do the 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 reverse mapping means from the cipher text the gibberish data or intel and intelligible uh, data is uh, what is called a cipher text will be able to convert back to the plain text only if you know the secret data okay so of course this being gibberish you might not uh, expect if people if the adversary does not know the key right you might not see any correlation between the data and the cipher text but there are some special primitive uh, primitives called homomorphic encryption schemes that allow those who don't have the secret key to operate on the data right uh, they won't decrypt okay just like that they for instance say say you give out encryption of say one and uh, uh, yeah two two values say one and one okay the cloud will be able to still add the cipher text without decrypting it to get the encryption of two right that's magic right and then also multiply data the moment you can do add and multiply you will be able to compute any function on the data okay so now so here to coming back to my application the before you sending out your data to the cloud the iot cloud you encrypt your data okay and now that on the cloud the 
to be able to you know perform queries for instance email right so you can have your whole gmail thing encrypted but then you know uh, but you want to query you access your email right but the google should not know that so you it will perform that email search on the encrypted data and give you back the result in the encrypted form only you can decrypt it okay so you, this is the best of both the worlds right but then things is not as easy as it sounds because these primitives are still about like about 100000 times thousand times slower than uh, than operating on the and the, the plain text data okay Pro it offers a lot of promise but still there are a lot of opportunity for research and then to improve the efficiency and practicality of these applications right so more on this form of encryption scheme it will be Uh, spoken by Professor Ayantika Chatterjee from IIT Kharagpur. That will be Wednesday afternoon, right? And this has a lot of application. I just mentioned uh, encrypted emails, right? Privacy preserving machine learning, data analytics. So you need a lot of data, you know, to do accurate analytics. So people want to share the data, but they are worried about the privacy. You know, why the hospital should give the entire data of the the, the record of the patients, right? So that you can perform analytics. can they somehow give it in the encrypted form and then you do analytics give them back the 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 result and they can you know quickly decrypt it right they don't want hospital doesn't want they don't want to out you know invest resources on computing on doing analytics right that's your job but you know they may be able to just decrypt out so you know upload the data and they decrypt the data right so they will be able to do this so this you know gives uh, uh, achieves best of both the worlds so their privacy is also concerned patient's privacy is also concerned but you will also be able to do your analytics right but then all this is good okay but what is very important and there was one of the questions will you deal with any implementation stuff well we will not do any demo right so because it's uh, you know we will be talking about only about the you know the overview right so we will not be able to get into sufficient Uh, details to implement but i just want to you know mention that implementing is also extremely important it's not just design you know cryptographic primitives you know and then argue about its mathematical security right it's extremely the important that you implement that right efficiently in hardware and software okay hardware for instance is your bank cards right uh, the pin uh, is in encrypted form otherwise anyone with the card reader will be able to read off your pin right and then use the card to uh, withdraw money from an atm for instance right so it should be encrypted okay and it should be and efficient you don't want to stand in front of an atm for several minutes so that processing happens right you want it quickly so it it has to be efficient but it's not just efficiency right it should also be secure so it turns out that there are some class of implementation based attacks called side channel attacks okay so where the adversary suppose Uh, you know, as this cartoon humorously depicts, right, is able to observe your implementation. Suppose someone stole your bank card, okay, and then they try to you know make several guesses of your PIN. You know? It it can try the adversary. Then, uh, if he possesses the hardware, will be able to measure the amount of time the the cryptographic uh, implementation takes to run, right? It will be also able to uh, measure the amount of uh, the 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 power consumed, right? so all this about 25 years ago uh, uh, you know so the surprising attacks were revealed to the the research community and then now these things have been like uh, very well investigated how you can use timing power or electromagnetic emission cache attacks or it could be even acoustics right i mentioned uh, you you uh, know in the iot example that someone could just watch an ordinary bulb right of 80 feet apart and they could decipher the conversations right so these are all another very classical examples of side channel attacks so so here typically crypto was thought out to be black box encryption scheme or signature scheme okay you give the input give the output but you know the community had not considered what if someone can you know observe the implementation or the behavior of the the physical phenomenon behind the the implementation or that accompanies the implementation so these things they were all used to you know, you know reveal actually the key you know, which can be more devastating right so you have your bank cards now nowadays even this contactless payment uh, is becoming very popular right uh, so suppose if i just you know 
pass by you you know with some sophisticated instrument just to mount a channel attack i take it to your near your purse right so i'll try to not just uh, make a payment but who, who knows i may be able to read off your pin right so so it is very important to look at you know all this uh, consider the implementation security of crypto primitives okay i just see that there are some questions uh, it's by maruti uh, it's uh, okay i'll just read the question in fhc should both the operands encrypted using the same key to be eligible for computation of cipher text um uh, yeah typically yeah that's that is the typical setting right yeah so you can you even have the public and the private keys they are typically is encrypted using the public key anyone can encrypt right so this is called single key fhc right but you can even have multi key you also have protocols that support multi key uh, operations so each of them they encrypt using their own public keys for instance and then it will be able to the cloud will be able to perform computation on those things so theoretically it's possible uh, sir there is a question from ramakant kumar uh -huh. is there any method that can be used so that attacker will not be able to change the message during transmission that is uh, will not be able to disturb communication see that could be a hard problem right see for example what if they cut off the communication link right they just you uh, know your telephone wire you cut off right you cannot do anything right so that's why i said you no know, i chose my words carefully so you should not make sure that adversary will not be able to modify right if he or she modifies you should be able to detect okay so if someone in the transit okay that must be you know, it's so easy to bring you know uh add noise to the medium and then corrupt the messages right but then uh, you should be able to detect and that's where even the coding theory is also used right uh, to secure the uh, error correction codes for instance right to so if it is the corruption is to a tolerable limit you will be able to detect and correct possibly even correct but just an answer is you may not always be able to detect. Yeah, there is a question from uh, Dr. Shravani. Mm -hmm. What is the basic needs to study for MPC? What Sorry. is the basic needs to study for MPC? You mean the motivating applications? Uh, maybe you can just yeah, uh, try to promote uh, Dr. Shravani as a, a panelist and then she can, or unmute, allow them to talk so that uh, they can understand the question better. Uh, how can we embed and uh, encrypt data in some files? Just audio, video, etc. Uh, uh, could you repeat that question, please? How can we embed the and encrypt data in some files? Text, audio, video, etc. Oh, so oh, this is what is called technography, right? So you try to embed some secret uh, information uh, in a video, and then uh, you try to communicate that pattern to uh, the recipient. But those who are just looking at that, then you know they will not be able to. Uh, they will to. They, it would appear just like a normal audio, but then they will be able to still decipher some message. So this is called stenography, right? So this uh, also uh, a different approach to security, right? Yeah. So there are tools to do that, techniques to do that. Uh, I will allow uh, Dr. Shrawni to uh, to talk. Okay. Yeah. Hello. Oh, hello, Dr. Shawni. How are you? Hello, hello, sir. Uh, it's great. It's a pleasure to see you again uh, talking on the such a special and topic. Thank you for joining. Yeah, sir, definitely. So, uh, like, I I always know that you are a great researcher, and uh, it's my kind of uh, honor to join this and listen to you. So, I would like to know, like, uh, uh, if uh, somebody wants to pursue a career in uh, MPC or you know homomorphic encryption. What exactly that person has to study as a basics? I mean, if like I I am uh, into cryptography field, so I know the basics. So, mm -hmm. but apart from that, is there any mathematics requirement or you know? So uh, see, understanding of a thorough understanding of foundations of cryptography, I think that will be that, will be, that would be the first point, no okay. second point. So I'll also in the next few slides I'll try to share some uh, resources, right? Uh, of course, MPC Professor Ashish Choudhury he will 
Uh, I'll just talk about this in, in Pital uh, thing also. Okay. Uh, so there are a couple of resources and then a lot of videos also available on homophic encryption. Very good resources. So there are a lot of opportunities uh, you know, to pursue uh, research in, uh, in these areas. Yes, it's a very interesting and privacy uh, is my interest. So thank, thank you. Thank you, Professor. And in the new course, of course, then you can pick up what are, you will get to know, you know what are the mathematical or computer science prerequisites. Not a lot, but something you we need to know some basics of algebra, for instance, very basics, right? Okay. Uh, so that can be, once you, you know, undergo a course, right, then you will get to know all those things. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. Yeah, thank, thanks, you. Thank you. Okay. So any uh, other questions? Yeah, there is a question from Kalika Prasad. Uh, his question is, uh, does the private key cryptography are still in use? If yes, where it is used? Oh, it's a yeah. workhorse. So when I talk about block ciphers, I'll just mention that. So private key cryptography is really the backbone because of its efficiency, right? Uh, but it doesn't so so public. So yeah, it's a popular misconception that public key crypto just we don't need. It's more secure, or it, you know, it has replaced private key. That's not true. So you need both because each offers its own comes with its own set of advantages and disadvantages. Uh, yeah, a uh, few more questions. Uh, and, uh, there is a question from Debsis. Uh, is it possible to combine cryptography with any other data security approach? Um, attack security. Uh, no, I told you right. It's an inherent part of information security. So, so there's no, there's no premise even to think uh, that they are different. Okay. So there are some very interesting questions. Uh, 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 oh, maybe uh, yeah, you can read it off. Uh, okay. Yeah, um, there is a question from Rishi. Can you talk about some approaches we can use to prevent adversarial examples to break down machine learning models? Oh, that's a very nice question. And then, then a lot of works have been going on. Uh, but yeah, I should confess that I'm not an expert on, uh, you know, on, the, on machine learning, particularly in this question, what you have asked. But I certainly will be able to point to resources where they can, they have tried to break down machine learning models. Right? And I am I would not be surprised if crypto techniques are also part of it because we look into the worst case thing, right? So, yeah, it's uh, yeah, it's a very good question. Sorry, I may not be able to. I can only point out resources, but I not able to, you know, give you specific examples right away. Yeah, I think uh, one last question from Vikas: uh, relationship between functional encryption and homomorphic encryption. Ah, again, a very nice, very nice question. Uh, see. Okay, functional encryption will allow you, so all the ciphertexts are created in such a way that you are able to compute one particular function or one small class of uh, functions of the ciphertext, okay? So maybe uh, just to give you an example, uh, uh, so oh, you encrypt, uh, uh, okay. So let me think of one, one interesting, uh, Example for functional encryption. Uh, uh, suppose you just want to learn a parity of the message. It means number of, say, number of ones. No, is it odd or even, right? Number of, say, suppose you encode the message as a, a binary string, right? Uh, then you have zeros and ones, and you're just worried about the number of ones. So basically, odd or even. So instead of, you know, uh, so, and you create a ciphertext, right? And then you don't want uh, the receiver to know the entire message. Of course, once the receiver will know the entire message, he or she can compute the parity for themselves, right? That, that's very easy. But then after you want to encrypt in such a way that, that you know, the adversary will only, uh, sorry, not the adversary, the recipient will only learn the parity of the message, right? So this is where functional encryption is used. Right, it's just particular functions, and many for many applications, you know, that would suffice. You would know what is the function in advance, but in homomorphic encryption, it's just like it's an open ended world where you can do any computation. So, so the so homomorphic encryption is more powerful than functional encryption because you can do all what you can do on functional encryption, and you do not even decide on the function a priori, 
right? But still, why functional encryption is interesting is because if you know many things in advance, then it can be much more efficient uh, than half of encryption. See, everything comes at a cost, right? You want flexibility, then you need to pay more, right? So this is the relationship between functional encryption and perfect encryption. Hope that answers your question, Vikas. Yeah, I hope this answers even Dr. Chandrasekhar's question also, the advantage of homework and homomorphic encryption. Uh, okay. There is a question from Arun. Mm -hmm. uh, loss of a private key through deletion yeah. accidentally or otherwise is catastrophic in practical applications. Are, the, are there algorithms which are resilient in the face of such loss? An algorithm having multiple private keys or something of that sort? Again, excellent question. Uh, okay. Mm. So you were, so uh, maybe just read the question again. I just want to know, you want the protocol to be resilient against key loss, right? Yes, yes. I would say not fully, right? If you lose a key, you lose a key, right? But there are some workarounds around that. So suppose using this site channel index, you learn part of a key, right? So then you can still have the message completely hidden. So the area of leakage resilient cryptography deals with a partial exposure to key. So, and then you also have some primitives called forward secrecy, right? Then suppose you encrypt, uh, and you update the key. Okay, and in the process you lose the key. The future messages you will not be able to read it. Okay, or maybe I just maybe I missed it. Uh, so sorry. Let me think. Uh, that's I know this this forward secrecy, backward secrecy. They can be a bit confusing at times. Um, of course, you key update, then you encrypt, and then uh, of course you will not be able to decrypt. Uh, yeah, even the the future, the backward messages, right? Yeah, probably that's, uh, yeah. I just, sorry, I just, uh, you know, I'm yeah, myself got uh, confused about that, but you, there are some workarounds to that, but complete loss of key, I don't know. I mean, I am not aware of that. And this is also a very, very important uh, problem. You know? So, so you know that uh, there was, I think some Canadian uh, uh, digital currency stock market, so that the, the main the owner died and then you know I, and the, the wife claimed that the key is also lost with him you know so so millions of uh, dollars uh, it's just gone right because you lost the key <laughs> so but then and also say if you suppose you design efficient techniques in order to still recover then 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 that means that you are you can break any cipher right but that that's also bad so these things are uh, you know they are they are uh, they are uh, they are contrasting uh, problems correct right so you use a key in order to safeguard okay so only those who know the key should be able to open it up but then you are presenting a completely opposite problem where if even if i don't have the key how should i do that no this is fundamentally they are you know very opposite problems okay so I hope that answers your question. Okay. Yeah, Anything maybe else? we can continue with the talk. There are a couple of more questions coming up. So maybe we can discuss later. Okay, yeah, sure. Yeah, yes, yeah um, I think I'm going pretty slow, so I will need to hurry up. Okay. Uh, so this is the setup where it what was used to, you know, you can uh, try to measure the, the power consumed by a microcontroller. Okay, this is a setup where you can perform this power analysis, power analysis attacks. Right, and then crypto, as I said, is like yes, information security, the big box is the huge domain, and then you have crypto, the core, and then you have the crypto engineering, the yellow circle, where you also look at the implementation aspects, and then, then there are lots, lots of, lots of primitives, okay, so then, you know, uh, then also what is interesting to know is crypt's information security is not alone, it has a lot of, you know, implications, to and from economics, politics, social science, and law. You know, so, so one, one other uh, example I routinely give is this example from law. You still need laws, right? Because what if it was so perfectly fine to beat up your friend to extract the key and decrypt his messages? If it was legal, then no amount of crypto will help, right? So then you need to have a law that you cannot forcefully extract a key from someone, right? 
then uh, so this is how we have it so similarly politics economics and and of course uh, you can have your key to be like very tens of thousands bits long but that's not economically advantageous right so it's always a trade off between security and uh, cost so that's where the economics social science all these phishing attacks you know they are they come under the realm of social science or oh, politics you know politicians they, they always have this trouble with crypto right and they have a sincere need to regulate crypto right but then you make it think so strong that you know uh, say anti social elements they can talk to each other without law enforcement agents you know they are not able to read so then so this where you know crypto you know comes uh, uh, to the headlines right so so this is where you know politics economics law and social science can uh, can uh, and i have uh, information with information security and then crypto right so and then crypto has a lot of industrial applications right and uh, you know, personal applications i told you in https it's a fundamental part of what is called the transport layer security previously called uh, secure sockets layer right and then so the, what are the primitives they are used is and and the key exchange and authentication mainly the diffie hellman key exchange rsa okay i mean these things sounds for the first timers it might seem strange then you know, we will see all these things you know uh, slowly gradually in stream cycles block cycles so i am sure so this you know uh, answers uh, this gives a provides a comprehensive answer to one uh, the, the person who asked the private Do people still use private key crypto? You know, both stream ciphers and block ciphers uh, is used in uh, TLS. Okay, and uh, what are the primitives involved in Bitcoin? It uses hash function SHA two fifty six and signature digital signature algorithm BCDS. Right? Of course, encryption uh, it would use somewhere. Right? And uh, and it would also involve some multi signature schemes, random number generators, zero knowledge proofs. Very interesting. And Zoom. Right? So, it uses this tls and then it also uses aes a block cipher a private key a symmetric key primitive uh, aes in the galva counter mode this game okay smart card iot device crypto is everywhere right and then this is how the tls works but so it's a exchange between the client and server where you exchange the key and then you come up with a common secret key and then you you do some certificate verification so on okay so in the interest of time i would not Get into the details of this. I need to get into crypto as soon as possible, right? Uh, but then you can always look up. You know, there are very interesting articles, videos about this. How TLS works, how it establishes secure session between client and server, right? and how the what are the various crypto primitives used in that. Okay. okay so more important. So here are the references, right? Uh, so. so you might already know some books right like william stallings is a very very good and popular book that deals with cryptography network security and some other aspects of information security also right so but if you want to look into like understand really the crypto from the mathematical the foundational point of view then cadson windel is an extremely good book but it would need some you know mathematical maturity also uh, so maybe you want to start off reading william stallings book right and then then uh, in your next attempt maybe you can look into this modern introduction to modern cryptography okay? and there are also other like very classical books like a handbook of applied cryptography that's like an uh, encyclopedia but it's a bit outdated but it's freely available right um, and then uh, the book by douglas stinson cryptography theory practice is also you know and this cryptography made simple is also another nice uh, book you know not as rigorous as intro to modern cryptography uh, but then uh, it's also fairly recent right by professor nigel smart okay and then there are excellent courses online courses on coursera by dan bonay and then one of those authors of this book uh, jonathan katz very 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 nice and our own uh, Faculty Professor Ashish Chaudhary also has an excellent course on foundations of cryptography, uh, and uh, it's 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 largely based on the book I mentioned, right? Intro to Modern Cryptography. That's a very very nice course. I recommend uh, viewing that. And then, uh, if you want to know uh, the implementation aspects, then there's also books on crypto engineering that deals with all the implementation details. 
okay those who are interested to know more about that side channel attacks hardware uh, a brief intro to hardware implementations also right and then there are also some many popular conferences you know particularly for crypto engineering this is called a chess conference and then so there's a there's an organization called international association for cryptologic research iacr so they host some flagship uh, conferences and then workshops and so on you know that's will be a, you can also become a member of that so that's a very good resource for crypto and i'm sure something similar will be there for the security also and so those are very popular uh, conferences for security good so this is very briefly the motivation to learn crypto now we will dig into some details okay first i'll begin with symmetric key crypto okay particularly the encryption okay symmetric key encryption so we'll see what is that so encryption what it does is you know it transforms a plain text that is intelligible possibly intelligible to cipher text which is gibberish which you don't know the key okay and if they use the same key for encryption and decryption then decryption is the reverse process where the gibberish message is converted to the intelligible the original message it's called a decryption okay so encryption scheme it provides confidentiality Okay, those who are not not supposed to read those messages will not be able to read those messages. Okay, under some assumptions. So this is what is an encryption scheme. Symmetric key encryption uses the same key to encrypt and decrypt. So more formally, an encryption scheme consists of three algorithms. Okay, uh, it as I mentioned, it uses a key to encrypt plain text to produce cipher text. Okay, uh, and the key could also be or another key can be used for. A decrypting ciphertext. So, if you use the same key for encryption and decryption, it is what is called symmetric key crypto, crypto, crypto or encryption scheme. Right? And if you use a different key, a public key for encryption, okay, uh, and a private key for decryption, it has to be private, right? So, you don't call, you don't want to make a decryption public, otherwise anyway, anyone will be able to decrypt. So, then it's called public key encryption scheme. Okay, we'll talk about public key encryption scheme uh, a little later. So, what does the encryption process do? So suppose you you have a message little m, okay. So let me try to open the marker. Okay, I think it's there already. Right? A little m, that's your message. It comes from the uh, what is called a message space. Okay, it's just a set of all possible messages that you want to encrypt, and it produces a cipher text. It could comes from a cipher text space. Why am so why so typically you tend to view this plain text. And the cipher text has bit strings, right? True, it's bit string, right? Uh, all the modern computers, digital computers use the binary encoding, right? Uh, then you, okay, but typically they can also belong to different algebraic structures, okay? So this might become, uh, may not be in this course, but it's possible that, you know, they belong to different algebraic spaces. And then uh, uh, how do you do the decryption is you take the cipher text, you take the key, and then you output the corresponding plain text, okay? Of course, some property should be really satisfied, obviously satisfied, it has to correct. You encrypt a message with respect to key, and you decrypt with the same key for symmetric encryption, then you should get back the message, right? So you should not result in any loss, and they have to be efficient. If you know the key, all these procedures should be efficient. And if you don't know the key, and that's where the security comes in, then it should be you know nearly impossible to to you know uh, find out the message. Okay, do this encryption decryption, right? So this diagram will illustrate uh, the 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 process of the symmetric encryption scheme. You have a sender, right? You have a you have a plain text, correct? Then you encrypt, you input the key. Okay, to produce what is called a cipher text and use the same key to decrypt. So cipher text key, you decrypt, you get that plain text and, and the recipient receives it, okay? So Shannon cipher, the one-time pad, okay? So this, so, so let's next look at that, uh, one of the simplest symmetric encryption scheme, you know, which is extremely simple conceptually and you might have already seen that before. It's called one-time pad or Shannon cipher. Um, so what you do is you generate, so assume your, for simplicity, they are all bit strings of length n, okay? When n is one, you just one bit, you know, your message will be one bit, your key will be one bit, your ciphertext will be one bit, okay? So if there are n bits, then what you do is you randomly choose a key, uniform random, 
okay then you take a plain text which is in bits long and you you compute the cipher text c by xoring this the message and the key okay so you i suppose you know what is xor if you don't know what is xor it's a simple operation on on the the plain text okay so in this example n is one that means as i said key message and cipher text are all bits okay so here suppose you have the cipher text here which you know message which could be zero or one and key zero or one so zero xor zero is zero okay zero xor one is one one xor zero is one and one xor one is zero so can someone tell in the chat how you how to easily remember this the xor operation some mantra so that you can know you will be able to uh able to remember oh modulo 2 oh excellent addition modulo 2 okay but many may not know what is this addition modulo no odd one detector okay so that's a easy way to remember good so uh, if there are even number of ones which could be zero ones right so then it's zero if there are odd number of ones then xor of them is one that's just a parity okay so that's a very easy to remember and this can be generalized to n bit strings where xor will happen you know for each bit position xor okay so just to give you an example so so le just let's take an example 0 1 suppose your key is 1 1 you want to xor with it right and your answer will be 1 xor 1 is you look at the table it's zero no carryover okay so this is different from addition and then no carryover fine so 0 xor 1 will be 1 simple right so you extend it to n bits by just doing the bit xor for each bit position okay? and then uh, no prices for guesses uh, decryption will be you take the cipher text you use the same key right remember that and you get back the message okay so and then so this you can see that because the moment you when you decrypt what will happen you had m equal to c xor k right okay now you xor with the key again and this is similar to your integers you know it is commutative associative instead of c xor k k you can always do it as k xor k but k xor k is always zero right 0 xor 0 is 0 1 xor 1 is 1 xor 1 is 0 so this will cancel out Suppose, sorry you are supposed to do c xor k but c itself was m xor k right that that's what i expanded so k xor k will cancel off you get back m this is all you wanted right so correctness is ensured and this is also turns out to be perfectly secure okay so now uh, you know you might get some doubts oh what if the key is bit you can do brute force the point is not that when you formally define the security so what the security requirement right particularly what is it's perfect security what it says is adversary should not be able to learn any more about the plain text right than you know uh, any more from the cipher text than what it already knew suppose you know the message was zero or one you know it could encode you no know, you want to wage a war or not you might already know that you know, message could be one with probability 0.75 means message is zero with probability 0.25 so if i look at the cipher text okay and if i don't know the key if key was randomly uniform randomly and independently chosen just looking at the cipher text i will not be able to determine anything about the message so i would not know anything more the probability from 0.75 did not become 0.76 just looking at the cipher text so in this way so it has completely hidden the message okay so you will not learn anything more than what you already knew okay so right that's what i have written formally it means that seeing only a single cipher text does not reveal any information about plain text but there's a catch you cannot reuse the key if you the moment you use the same key to encrypt two one time pads right the two messages using one time pad you will start leaking the messages but there's a drawback the keys has to be as long as the messages correct right so this is the most simple 
security called as ciphertext only security means you only see the ciphertext of one message and you want to deduce the underlying message so yes so one time pad offers the security that's why you see yes in green but there could be more sophisticated attack scenarios right where it would have some knowledge you know it already might have some known plain text and then uh, corresponding encryptions for instance suppose you send a letter right you start say good morning you start with a greeting and http headers they have a fixed structure right it would be able to observe you know those plain text and then uh, you know uh, uh, those plain text and the corresponding ciphertext that you suppose you always encrypted zero to one particular entity say one and one to zero so looking at this pattern it might be able to deduce the rest of the messages so this attacks can be relevant and sometimes you could adversary could force you to encrypt uh, you know messages of its choice right uh, suppose you are you are uh, you are you know just a trivial example is you are a cloud service provider you want to just you know demonstrate the security of your encryption scheme you might offer a service where you are just you know you'll ask the plain text and get the correspond cipher text now even in practical situation also this can happen you know many times uh then uh, you know so then it will know the messages of its choosing it can choose some special messages so all zeros all ones and then you know uh and then uh, and then get guess cipher text on seeing a new cipher text you should be able to tell okay what the message was okay one time pad won't offer security against known plain text chosen cipher text strongest class of adversaries are what are called the chosen chosen cipher text attack adversaries here okay it the adversary can take cipher text of his choice and it will be able to you know get it decrypt you know uh, get the corresponding decryption okay and then so still on a new cipher text right uh the adversary should not be able to learn anything so this is the goal for cca or the chosen cipher text attack security but one time pad is not secure against this class of attack also okay? so one important principle is uh, you know and a common policy is they, they you know typically uh, people think that the security can be achieved by making the encryption decryption algorithm itself secret right So many times they have to do that. They might be compiling application, but a very good practice in crypto is cipher description should be made public. You should know how the encryption decryption happens. The secrecy should only rely on the secrecy of the key, right? So if your algorithm is secure against these things, uh, this you know, uh, you know, when you make your uh, things public, uh, they are. description algorithm and known relies only on the secrecy of the key then you know we get confidence in using that see there are some you know practical concern also that key is very short and easy to store right descriptions of algorithms are like they are so big right and even, even if someone leaks accidentally leaks right and then you know, there will be multiple users having different keys using the same thing so it's not a good idea to make the encryption or the decryption algorithm key generation algorithm itself you know private secret right it should only depend on secrecy of the key so this is the one time pad and it has i told you it has a you know restriction that key should be as long as the messages in fact these things are mathematically proven right it's not convenient right you know particularly in the iot setting or modern applications you want to download a movie file and you want to have a key as long as the movie is several gigabytes long it's not good right you want to have a short key like few hundred bit of few thousand bits and you want to expand up right few hundred bits okay uh, you want to expand it up to one gigabit length right so how do you do that so stream ciphers actually do that so they are mathematically what are called pseudo random generators right so this we will see in the next lecture so i'll just answer any questions if there are any uh yeah uh there is a question uh, what is cryptography without key is it possible crypto without key mm, there are some crypto primitives that don't use key right uh, hash functions for instance so you have primitives but entire crypto without key may not be possible 
Yeah, I'll move on to the next question uh, from Piyush. Uh, how does AI helps to resolve issue which are related to user security? When it comes to complete automation, lots of companies uh, prefer automation in today's scenario. Mm -hmm. So how AI can help with the automation to resolve the uh, data security? Ah, that's a very, very good question. Um, there are people are looking. Of course, I mentioned you our privacy preserving machine learning where they use crypto to you know, make uh, ML more private and secure. But, but there are like, it's all well studied that uh, now, now, I mean, or it's rather catching up where they try to use uh, ML methods to break, say, to assist site channel attacks, for instance. Okay. So, in this sense, you are trying to assess the uh, security of the crypto implementation. So, this is one connection. Uh, but still, probably we need to still see that in a more full fledged use of ML. That's what I would say. Okay. So, uh, how do we share the key with the IoT devices? That is a question. This is a question from Abhay. Uh, share uh, sorry, key what? with the IoT devices. Oh, all these crypto techniques are used. How do you generate secure session keys, right? And then, uh, so yeah, so crypto is used for all those things. Uh, do we so have if you want to know the details, look into the details of TLS, for instance. So then you will know how exactly is the crypto used. Uh, do we have uh, time for a few more questions or? Uh, oh, uh, go ahead. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's okay. not a hard stop, right? Those who want to log out, they can log out, but then we can always continue with this question. Yeah. Uh, there is a question from Kalika Prasad. Suppose we propose a modified cryptography, either public or private, that looks mathematically secure. How can we test it is really secure and fast? Wow. That's, <laughs> yeah, that's a hard uh, question, you know. So, so these we got confidence in this you know RSA Elgamal, right or uh, digital whatever our signature algorithms because it has stood the test of time. Now of course you have some mathematical reasoning where you show that your crypto does not have any weakness other than the hardness of the underlying problem. But how do you how do you know the underlying mathematical problem, right? For instance, uh, it could be the discrete log problem. It could be the the factoring problem, right? Or in the post-quantum world, all those lattice problems. Okay, people know it's NP complete, but doesn't, you know, no one has unconditionally proven it's to be hard, right? So one has to, you know, these things should withstand the test of time. There's also a, a repository of cryptonal attack, attacks. So, so whenever a new scheme, either symmetric key or public key scheme comes, so people try to apply some standard techniques, cryptanalytic techniques to see that you know, your, your new uh, proposed algorithm is secure. So if it is, if it is not, as you can, you know, mathematically uh, show that the security is equivalent to a well-studied problem, then okay, people find that that's secure, right? But if it is not the case, then, uh, then it has to withstand the test of time. I hope I have answered your question. So there is a question from Vikas. Uh, in FHE, what techniques do we use to verify whether the correct function was evaluated? In functional encryption, he thinks it is not the issue. Uh, again, a very good question. Uh, so how do you bring in verification schemes to say functional encryption, or maybe you can even extend it to home office encryption, right? Uh, so MPC also kind of these, these with malicious adversaries, okay? So there are techniques where you can do that. Currently, is it maybe you can try to club it with also with some zero knowledge proofs, and then you know there are ways you can also bring in uh, verification that you know you the computation what the the cloud has done is correct or not. And there are also other techniques in computer science to verify the accuracy of computation. Those things can also be deployed. But again, all these things they add. They add um, more layers of inefficiency. Yeah, I think uh, uh, it's actually a suggestion from Palak Tandon. Mm -hmm. He needs a 
he has he is from mathematical background and uh, he need a bit of advice on mm -hmm. how he can uh, understand these topics okay yeah. oh yeah, yeah no but like i mean just i said just sit through a crypto course right a lot of i told you good resources available so you will figure it out okay so some basic understanding of algebra some basics of number theory uh typically yeah if you look into all the crypto attack attacks on stream ciphers you need a bit of statistics bit of probability right yeah so this is a lot more applied yeah of course people also research into like uh uh how do you how do you solve large factoring challenges with discrete law so it can become or elliptic you know get into more details of elliptic uh, pairing based cryptography so if you there are a lot of scope to look into the mathematical aspects also right then it would involve, involve algebraic number theory geometry of numbers uh, uh, so on right uh, yeah yeah as i said algebraic number theory right it can you can uh, you know get into a lot of mathematical details it's all you know so once you start start understanding you know, reading some intro uh, crypto books so you will you'll get to know you know and you know you'll get to know what math needed and then which parts you like more and where you want to delve so that's uh, one of the advantage of working with highly interdisciplinary field right you can get into the mathematical aspect you can get into algorithmic aspects uh, and you can get into implementation aspects hard, hardware aspects you know hardware fga applications and you can look into the policy aspects you know that's also we are the next lecture will be on that you know very important policies you know? So, uh, how do you formulate policies that make the whole, uh, you know, the security environment more conducive? Okay, or, or kind of the whole infrastructure conducive to security and privacy, right? So, so Shridhar will talk about those things. So, there are a lot of lot of aspects you can look into that. So, it's all it's your interest what you want to look into. Yeah, I think we can close with one last question. Uh, the how the hash value in SHA-56 is of its length? It's yeah, it's, it's length. No, I mean, that's how, how is it possible to have a fixed length output in SHA-256? Yeah, that, that's the whole magic, right? That, that's the definition of a hash function. You can, it will have a large domain or an infinite domain, but the output is only finite, right? So, but yet you can, yeah, there will be mathematically, there will be some collisions, right? You will have multiple, uh, inputs mapping to the same output but then the the magic here is you will not be able to find such things easily right that's what that's why you have cryptographic hash functions right so yeah we will we'll try to see briefly i'm sorry i mean because the time is so limited right so the purpose is to just introduce you to some key terms and answer some questions so that you pursue these things in more detail and also this will set some stage for the later speakers who want to get into the depth. So we have like too many things to cover. Probably I will uh, rush. Okay. So I remember I still need to answer one question on forward and uh, uh, backward uh, secrecy. I, I will do that in the next lecture. I'll remember that. Good. So people are like, so much uh, I urge you all, once the lecture ends, maybe by tomorrow, I request volunteers to set up uh, a feedback a collection mechanism, right? Uh, where they can uh, uh, pass on the feedback. It will be useful for the speakers also you know, for their future sessions. Okay. Uh, if you can do that, that will be great. Right. Yeah. Thanks for, yeah, thanks for answering the questions. And uh, yeah, people are really interested to get to know. Please oh, post it on Julip chat if you have any further questions. And uh, yeah, we will try to follow up that later also offline. Right. Good. So see you all at two o'clock.